<clears throat> what is up, everybody? Jeez, it is Dominic D'Angelo of SEScoops.com. You see us here today on the Premier Streaming Network, potentially, if you're watching on Friday. But I am here. It is one of a kind with RVD. And guess who's here? Guess who is here? I can't believe it. It's RVD. Rob. What? What? You're here? Jeez. I love RVD. He's so effing cool. What about the Polish prince? Do you like him? Uh, He's got potential. He's got potential, you think? Okay. Robbie yeah. V. Now, I heard good things about Robbie V, though. Matt yeah. Burns, not so much. He was a bit of a black sheep. <laughs> Dude, I need, I need like a action figure package with all these different, different shades of me. <laughs> <laughs> all the the evolution of RVD. It's just yeah, I was an international patriot, flying tiger. Would the battle of the barbarian be in there too? Yeah, absolutely, absolutely sweet for sure. <laughs> <laughs> we gotta start. Yeah. That's the one way we can start getting promotion going. Is that? It's a yeah. <laughs> Yeah, we should bring photos of this stuff maybe for the show. You think so or no? Oh, yeah, I agree. Like, yeah. Like if people are watching it, boom, put a photo up of the Battle Creek Barbarian. I like it. Send it my way, too. I'll put it up on social media and get some, some shit cooking on there, too. So. We were just talking about trying to get some different things going to make the show uh, interesting and uh, maybe doing more live, mm -hmm. uh, maybe regularly going live into the recorded episodes so uh as always listen to me tell you to comment below ignore it and go on about your day yes so it's, give us some feedback if you guys want something you have an idea that you'd like to see us do let us know and we can we can try to make it happen if it seems to fit the whole bill of it all so do it do it to it do it to it rob you were in new york this past weekend weren't you yes how was it uh, it was it was awesome. It was a great trip. It was uh, cold, you know, um, and, and, and it's not anywhere near as cold as it's going to get. That's what I just kept thinking, you know, like, fuck, I didn't bring a jacket. I had to wear Katie's uh, sweater that she brought yeah. um, <laughs> around, <laughs> around town. But um, we went, uh, Katie was booked at a um at a booth for um uww uh signing autographs at mr olympia is that what it was, was, it, was, mr. Olympia? It was yeah. uh was that what it's called i think so okay. it doesn't sound right but i think that's what it is and uh <laughs> i don't know maybe not but it's it's i think that's what it was but anyway awesome convention it was so overwhelmingly huge and everything we didn't talk about this last week. No, I guess we did. No, you were talking about going there. And, okay. Uh, the aspect of yeah, what was happening. Well, I, I, you know, I figured there'd be a crossover between the bodybuilding and my life because I'm a wrestler. I lift weights. I figured there'd be a crossover, but I felt like everything there was my life. I was surprised at how much I could relate to everything the vendors had you know from protein to pre-workout to um uh, the outfits to to equipment to different um uh different uh, proteins kratom gummies bunch of kratom boots uh th there was so much going on and then also activities at the same time like way over in the in the, in the place is so big a million square footage it seems like but way over in this corner they're on stage flexing, doing a bodybuilding pose down, down here, fitness competition, over by the bathrooms. All these power lifters are back there. Dude, I walked by the bathroom and I looked and there was this dude with a big barrel chest, you know, standing there. And he had uh, all these plates on the bar, on the bench press. There was too many plates to bother counting, you know. I started counting and I was just like, no, I didn't got time for that. I was like, dude, how much is that, bro? Um, 880 pounds. Holy shit. Yeah, I saw him put it up. He's like, dude, I'm a big fan. Can I get a picture? I'm like, 880 pounds, bro. Do you remember, like, not that long ago, it seemed like when Ted Arcidi had the world bench press record, what was it? It was 712 or 715? Holy yeah, that was a world record, and Jesse Ventura was like, I only helped four pounds worth. He still did 709. 
That's probably a horrible Jesse. I used to do Jesse better. That's anyway, <laughs> um, anyway, I was impressed. I saw him put it up. He came right back over to me. Can I get another picture? I don't think I want your note. I was just like, dude, sure, man. What the fuck? You're a monster, bro. And he was so big that, you know, he didn't really have very far to go because his chest and everything. He's such a barrel. You know, it's a, it's a really short movement when you're, uh, when you're that big. And holy fuck, I've never seen that many plates on a bar before. But overall, I can't wait to go back to the next one. That's awesome. So yeah. this was separate than what you were doing, too. Katie was at a, a, a bodybuilding yeah, no, I was just there to hang out with her, I think. Oh, oh no, no, we did a convention. That's right. That was the weekend before. That, that's oh. why I thought we talked about it, bro. Oh, okay, okay. Yeah, we did. That's why, yeah, that was the weekend before we did. I went there. 11-11 was our anniversary. No, it was the same fucking, I'm confused as fuck now. <laughs> I went there at the Olympia. Um, that was in Orlando. Sorry, I'm, I get okay. it. Now. It's He's starting to make sense now. That was in Orlando. And that was the week before in New York. Um, I was in a town I'd never heard of, I think called Bedford, New York. Yes, that's I think that sounds right, actually. Because Kevin Nash was there too. Brentwood, right? Brentwood sounds Brentwood. more. Mm -hmm. And um, yeah, anyway, it was uh, the big event, which is uh, at least annual, I think maybe semi annual. Maybe they do it a couple times a year, but. Um, they moved locations from being down in by the, uh, 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 I think it was by the JFK airport. They used to do um, in the movie Headstrong with RVD. Oh. I go to the big event and uh, you see me meeting all the wrestlers there. It was Bruno Sammartino's very last public appearance. Oh, Bobby Heenan's in there. One of his last appearances. King Kong Bundy is in there. Um, I'm really glad that I got that footage in Headstrong. It's a really emotional part of the movie, especially by the way Joe Clark uh, made it slow mo and put this piano music. It kind of it, it's it makes it really emotional. And also, I saw Pat Tanaka, um, who I hadn't seen since I was probably like 21 or something. And again, this year a big event, I saw Pat Tanaka. Those are the only two times I've seen him in like 30 years. There's, he must he must live in the area, huh, or somewhere on there. Um, you know, maybe maybe that is it. I just I I I was trying to figure that out, and I was like, I don't see him at all these conventions. Like, he must just have a guy that works at the big event that wants to book him or what, you know? And I asked him, like, are you, you know, do you do other kinds? I don't ever see you. And he was like, bro, I'm done. And I was like, uh, oh, I know what you mean, man. I go through this. He goes, no, I'm done. I'm like, okay, well, good seeing you. <laughs> <laughs> All right, Pat. Talk to you later. <laughs> yeah. But traveling is a motherfucker, and I go through my own, um, um, I don't know if I want to call them neuro neurotic episodes. Like, every time I travel, I still go through all this, all these cycles in my head of, not wanting to go to work, not wanting to, but I, I kind of do the same thing almost with any appointment. Why did I take this booking, you know? And it's like, I have a hard time just even like getting out of my comfort zone. And that's, that's something that, um, I don't know if it's a good thing or a bad thing could, that I could be so comfortable. I worked so hard to be so comfortable, but now it is hard to break out of it. And then, uh, and I do that every day, you know, before my matches too, I don't want to do it, you know, and, and I, I go through these things where eventually I come back around, I stretch, I start feeling good, like Superman, like, boom, yeah, let's do this. You know, and I, I just feel like like running sideways, boom, down the hallway, you know, and uh, and fucking uh, feeling great. But um, I, I, I do that. So I kind of thought maybe that's what he was talking about, you know, like maybe he had a hard travel day or something. But <laughs> he was just I, 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 I might not see Pat Tanaka again. That's right. That's what I'm thinking. You just might be done. <laughs> Man, he was very instrumental way back in the day, you know, when I was in Tampa when I uh first got the name Rob Van Dam by Ron Slinker. Um Pat Tanaka was one of the uh for a minute there he was the booker at the Sportatorium in Tampa. Um, and, uh, he was a, uh, a training, you know, the, the, the young guys would work out in the ring or whatever. And so I knew him from, from both of those, you know, 
Yeah. One time, one time I was in the ring working out, and this is when I was barefoot. And uh, he called me over to the side of the ring. You know, Rob, come over here. You know, I was like, all right. And I went over, and, and I went, and I just kind of like went through the ropes, but but hugged the rope so that I could just come down like on my knees on the apron. Mm -hmm. Bam! I I hit the corner of the apron. It went right between my toes and it broke my toe. <laughs> and one toe was folded over the other toe, like at a right angle. And I was like, ah, you know, like I was like so young. I wasn't used to seeing that yet. You know, yeah. I learned, from, I learned from that injury that you don't cancel a match just because you broke your toe in the daytime. You tape it to your other toe and you keep going. You fucking pussy. You know, that's, that's what I learned. <laughs> right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Yeah. So man, yeah, Pat Tanaka. I just remember him from like the Diamond Exchange. Back, uh, yeah, yeah, with, with with Paul Diamond. Yeah, Paul Diamond. Yep. And, uh, yeah, called me was... over there. Called me over there, and um, he wanted to break me out of my 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 comfort zone, out of my shell. I was shy, mm -hmm. right? Somehow, I guess he could tell that I was shy. He was over there uh, with his feet kicked up while we're working out, singing this song. And he thought it'd be a good idea to give me the microphone and have me sing the song karaoke style. Yeah. And of course I'm embarrassed as hell. I'm a you know 20 year old kid with red face going, oh my God, I, I, I don't know the words. So whenever I hear this song, I will always think about this embarrassing experience because Pat, he loved the song. He was feeling it. And when I hear the words, I get it now. It relates to the wrestling lifestyle. Maybe that's why he wanted me to sing it. Maybe he thought that that I would get it, that I would relate to it and feel it because it's that song. Um, um, uh, let's see, something at the hotel. Um, something in the hotel, stare at the wall. I have accountants pay for it all. They oh, say I'm crazy, but I have a good time. That song. Whenever he say, whenever I hear that, I'll always think of that. Because Pat was over there with his feet kicked up, you know. I stare at the wall, and I'm thinking like he probably does. He's at the hotel rooms, you know. Yeah. Him and, uh, they were at that point where they were rocking on WWE and doing some serious partying, and I was like, okay, I get it. You know, that that's his lifestyle, but. uh Dude, I just got out of high school. Leave me alone. I'm shy. Right. <laughs> Joe Walsh, life's been good to me so far. I think it is. That okay. It? Yeah, I think that's it. Life's been good to me so far. Yeah, I never even knew that's what they were saying until just right now, but that makes sense. Oh, okay. <laughs> yeah, that's only what they're saying. Yeah. How about that then? <laughs> yeah, I do that. I, I hear songs my whole life. And because I'm not musically inclined, sometimes I never hear the words. And then one day I'll, I'll be listening to the radio and it's so clear. And I'm like, that's what they're singing about? Like, I I used to hear that song when I was seven in, my, in, in, in the car with my mom on the way to the grocery store. And I've never listened to it until just now. That happens a lot with me. Yeah. I, I tell people all the time I'm not musically inclined. I don't, I don't. I don't use music as the uh, backdrop to to my life or let it subconsciously control my thoughts uh, any more than, you know, than, than I can help anyway. Yeah. And, yeah. You know, you know, so, like you were in uh, a couple episodes ago, just how much music influences and it's almost like a hypnotizer, a brainwash almost in certain ways. Like you're, you get accustomed sure. to it in a certain way. And, Sure. Yeah, people totally give themselves to that with that in mind. Like they want to feel it, they want to rock it, and you know they want that. They want it to take over and move them. And it's like that's exactly what you're doing, as you're saying, hypnotize me, music. You're right, right. <laughs> Get your dance face on. <laughs> yeah. Get your. <laughs> <Huh>? <laughs> exactly. <laughs> well, cool. Um. Uh, we had a little bit of feedback I had noticed on YouTube, so let's bring some of that up here. I this, wish people would talk about the dance face. I never heard anybody comment on it. No, right? And I have to bring it up on a bigger platform. Well, I, it's a I'm going to clip it. I'm going to clip it again and put it up on YouTube. All right, here's a good one. This was in regards to the Dreads guy from South Philly, the, the fan that, that you interacted with at the Oregon Diner. Okay, cool. Dread. Good yeah. guy. Good Bro crazy. Fan? 
or Oregon Diner is my spot. It's like four blocks from my house. This is Enos Y said twenty three seven. I mentioned before I live a few blocks from the old ECW Viking Arena. Went to almost every show because my friend's dad was security. Always get right when I think about those days. We would, of course, beat the shit out of each other on the walk back home using whatever we found in the dumpsters behind the Foreman Mills. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I remember the Foreman Mills. And then the, the guy below him says, Brando Lee says, I totally remember the dreadlock, dude, at a ton of ECW shows. I bet he had some dang. I bet yes. he had to have some dank. Man, I wish he did start wrestling. That would have been killer. <laughs> Shout out to you, Dreads, if you see this. Yeah, man. I hope, I hope he sees this. You know, I mean, I, I was talking about how crazy he was and stuff, but, you know, I still had a lot of a lot of love for this crazy ass. So I hope he doesn't, you know, I hope he doesn't come across like I was talking bad about him just because he's absolutely nuts and from another planet. Right. And you're the pot, you're Pyra, the flame god. <laughs> yeah, something like that. <laughs> but I just remember him saying, you know, one day it'll make sense to me, all the virgins, uh, uh I don't know why virgins, you know, like I, I don't know either. <laughs> I don't want to get into that detail, but <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm not sure that would be the perfect. Uh, but anyway, uh, yeah, I and mean, all the maidens of the earth will will come to me and bow and bow and kneel before me or some crap, and I'd be like, mm, "That's cool." Sweet, <laughs> <laughs> hey, all right. I look forward to that. I'll take some ash browns. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right speaking of hash browns uh aj rb two pounds says love the podcast i own a restaurant where an rvd match is usually play playing in the dining room while the boys in the kitchen listen to this pod thank you for the great stories and all the work over the years and many more definitely one of a kind i love that well that's fucking cool dude got a whole restaurant listening to us. you should uh he should film that activity going on on his phone and send it to you so you could fucking... Uh, yeah. Would you, would you put it up if he did that? If you were like, dude, it up. Yeah. That would be awesome. Give us some footage. Show us uh, Show us you're tuning in. And, and then seeing the RVD match, too. How about that? Um, when uh, Dango was doing... Uh, um, not chemotherapy, but the natural alternative stuff he was trying. I went down to Tijuana with him. Mm -hmm. Um one of his like last efforts, you know, to get rid of the, his cancer and they were doing everything, you know, the oxygen and the, um, a whole bunch of stuff at this alternative place. But anyway, um, I had to leave him be for a while for a treatment and I just walked a couple of blocks and thought, you know, there was this, this bar sitting there in Tijuana and I went in there and said, I'll go in and uh, have a drink. Maybe I ate. I think I ate and maybe <laughs> I had a beer. I did both. But anyway, <laughs> um, I totally did. I remember now. The food was good. But but while I was sitting there, you know, um, I look up on the TV and it's ECW from like 98. I'm like, you know, like, 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 like a lot of times when I go into a place, I'll hear my music hit. And it's always because there's a fan in there that's in charge, right? Yeah, that makes it sense. It didn't feel like that. It felt totally random. So I'm looking around like, did someone put this on because I'm because I'm here? Because I, I feel like it was just on. They happened to be watching uh, ECW from like, my God, what year was this? This was 2018-ish. Mm -hmm. and, and, and they're watching something that's uh, like... Yeah. 20 years old and then boom i come up on tv and i'm looking around and nobody knows and i was just like this is like totally just the universe syncing this up for me there's because there's not one person looking at me anywhere and there i am sabu and rvd wrestling the dudleys uh right on yeah. the tv for me you know and and that's that's a that's pretty cool. Sometimes uh, shit like that happens. No doubt, that showed a good reason why you were there too. You know everything. It felt like I was in touch with the universe. You know, like I was connected because that's that's one of those synchronicities. And I don't just say, "What are the odds?" You know, it's like yeah, I got I got to take that in, feel feel the universe. You know what I mean? Feel the connection, and uh, and. and get that assurance that I'm on the right path. That's, that's, that's how I take that. Oh, hundred percent. Man, that's, uh, that's very cool. Yeah. Um, so okay, somebody said about the Madison square garden, cause you were talking about how you weren't that all psyched about it. Uh, 
M. Marsh, 1972, says, as as a born and raised New Yorker who's been to countless Rangers, Knicks, WWE circus, and indoor tennis matches at Madison Square Garden for 30 years, RVD is right. MSG, built in 1968, is a dated building. It's old. Its amenities are old. It's too small, hence overcrowded. The concessions okay. are old and dated. Penn Station is directly below it. It is dated. Everything there is just obsolete compared to other sporting venues. Worse is the fact for having such a dated stadium, the owners, the Dolan family, still change, charge premium rates for tickets in the stadium well past its prime. So. Wow. I'm, yeah, I'm glad you picked that one uh, to, uh, to show me. And uh, because, because I always feel like I'm insulting people because that's their pinnacle of sports is MSG. And I can tell by, by how excited everyone gets, like, oh, my God, we're at MSG. And for me, uh, since I didn't have the nostalgia factor for me, it was a lot more – as as uh, he understood there that it was a lot more just like too small compact you know like like i said before the way i remember it was that everyone's bags take up the entire dressing room and you can't even fit a person and all the bags you got to go in like one at a time to dress and uh and, and it was just not my favorite building to go to and i always feel like when i say that that i'm like you know sorry for you know new yorkers and everyone that they grew up idolizing the gardens and making that their their holy uh you know bucket list destination like i don't i don't argue with you and your values <laughs> but for me uh not my favorite place no, it's not, not all it's cracked up to be you know the history is one thing but hey it's it's time for a change <laughs> Like, like there's one there's one toilet for for 20 wrestlers how you, how clean you think that toilet's gonna be by fucked up you don't want balls mahoney pissing on that seat <laughs> you don't don't want that happening what if you can avoid it right <laughs> <laughs> all right so oh uh we'll have to ask rob did you watch any wrestling this week nope all wait right. um did i watch any um aw no, WWE, no. Um, no, I guess I didn't. I guess I didn't watch any. All right. Hey. Just, just little clips on. Sometimes I'm not sure because I I get little clips, you know, on uh, social media all the time, or just little high spots or whatever. And yeah. sometimes that stands out in my mind. But. Well, that's how I think a lot of people consume wrestling, too, too, for the most part. Mm -hmm. um, this is not wrestling related, but I have this in their current stuff. Did you hear the news? That Snoop Dogg has announced that he's done smoking. Overall, he's done with weed, I think. I did. I did see that. Yeah, he says uh, after talking to uh, his family, he's decided he's done with smoke and to respect his uh, wishes. Uh, so uh, I know everyone is taking him at that word. You know, I looked at some comments expecting to see a lot of people say, ah, bullshit, or maybe he's just not going to smoke and he's going to do T THC drops. Who knows? Edibles. Mm -hmm. I don't know. But anyway, the comments that I did see were very supportive and I was, I was pleasantly surprised to see that. There's people like right on, man, you do your thing. It's a personal choice. And, and I, I, I don't know, I got um, a little extra, uh, resurgence of faith in humanity. I was like, wow, people are actually, you know, not like overly opinionated and uh, being uh, ridiculously stomping over the boundaries of, of you know, well, what they should, uh, where they should insert their feelings. That's how I thought. I mean, it's comments on social media, but I expected a lot of people would be like, uh, what the fuck, man, you sell out? Yeah, whatever, whatever. But that's cool. And, and then, you know, He's not saying forever, so whatever. Best wishes. Right, exactly. I wanted to ask, because the comedian I listened to, and he gave up weed, and he said that he's been going through like bad withdrawals where he can't sleep. He gets like headaches constantly all the time. Have you heard of anything like that when it comes to I know people's bodies are different or anything like that, but in your research and, and doing stuff, have you heard of stuff like that, like going through a big withdrawal if you just quit kind of like you're done for a while? I'm not familiar with um, withdrawals from suddenly quitting weed. However, um, if you have issues 
that weed is helping mm-hmm. and then you take weed away, those issues will come back, you know? So there's a good chance that this person wasn't a good sleeper anyway. That's what he was saying. He wasn't a good sleeper in the first place. It helped him sleep. And then he exactly. So what do you expect? I mean, it doesn't cure you, you know? Yeah, yeah. It just goes, it does its thing while it's in your system. And then when it's gone, you're, you're just you. So, so yeah, people that are, uh, have anxieties or, w- or whatever, um, if, if, if you're taking something that helps, cool. If you quit taking it, it's likely to come back. Right, right. All right. No, I wanted to get your perspective on that for sure. Cause I kept hearing about it and I was like, well, I should see what Rob says about this. Um, I'm curious. So we talked about the Iron Claw movie that was that's coming out. It's December twenty second, and it premiered, made this world premiere in Dallas. Kevin Von Erich was there and everything like that. But did you know somebody is playing the Sheik that you know? Do you know who's playing him? Mm-hmm. Chavo Guerrero Jr. is playing the Sheik. The original Sheik. The original Sheik. Really? Yeah. No, I didn't know that. That's interesting. Yeah, yeah. So he oh. was portraying the Sheik oh. in the Iron Claw movie. I thought that was pretty wild. Yeah, cool. And he's the one that trained the guys like Zach Efron and um, Jeremy Allen White. He's trained them all in the ring to for the movie itself. Um, and I know, I think, oh, go ahead, Rob. Are you I was going to say that doesn't surprise me because uh, that's what he does, you know. And and in the uh, that Netflix series on uh, Glow, Glow, he trained yeah. everybody, you know, and which I really enjoyed that series too. I watched a few a few episodes. I need to get back into it. I didn't. I never finished it. And I liked. I liked what I saw with it. it yeah, it. It's always cool when someone's able to take a piece of life and, uh, and, and, and stretch it out into making, making it a compelling story and to learn, you know, like what happened with some added drama, but, but, you know, really the, it, it was a story about David McLean, the producer that came up with glow and then, um, had the, uh, you know, the, the Hollywood people and, and whatever, and then ended up losing it. And then he started WOW, which I don't think they cover in the thing, but he's running WOW right now and he's trying to do the same thing and, and always has. But anyway, it was just really, uh, I thought it was really well told and made you invest your emotions into the characters and, and shit. Yeah, nice, nice. Did you happen to see the trailer yet for Iron Claw? No, I don't think so, no. Okay. I need to. I need it's to. It's yeah. really good. It's really good. Um, cool. I'll send it to you or something if I remember. Okay. Yeah, I forgot it was about it. But yeah, it's. I thought that was. I didn't even know he was. I knew he was training the actors in the. But I didn't know he was in the movie. And when I heard he was playing the sheik, I was like, oh damn, that's what. That's I'm awesome. Doing. Yeah. So that's. Pretty cool. Yeah. Um, the only th- other thing I wanted to bring up, we met. I mentioned it last week to you. Hook was tagging with Orange Cassidy, and uh, on Dynamite, said to you, he lost. He lost, Rob. Didn't didn't pan out for him. So hook hook and orange. Hook and orange lost. Hook took the pin too. He got he got the pin. Damn well, it. Yeah. Well, it uh, goes to show you not everyone's expendable and replaceable. That's right. We need choking smoke. We need yeah. choking smoke. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, yeah, that was it. Uh, what I was gonna do this week again was kind of akin to what we did last week. Uh, last week, if you guys didn't tune in, we uh, covered 25 years ago, November to re- remember, uh, 1998, and all the things that surrounded that, and uh, all you, the main event that Rob was in, the triple tag match, him, Taz, Sabu, versus the triple threat of Bam Bam Bigelow, Shane Douglas, and Chris Candido. So we cover that. If you guys haven't heard it, you can check it out on Rumble, on that uh, the link I always share on social media. Uh, you can check it out on Premiere, and you can check it out on Rob YouTube. Take a gander if you haven't seen that yet. But what we're going to do this week, we're just going to back 20 years instead of 25. We're going to take a look at 2003 and Survivor Series, all that surrounded around that time. And um, I just pulled from the observer of different things that were going on at that juncture. Uh, and one of the most interesting things, at the end of October leading into November, was uh, Stu Hart passed away, actually. Um he was 88 years old when it happened, born in 1915, and yeah, died. Uh, it, it was, I believe, I can't find it here, but he, I know he was 88. Rob, did you have any interactions with Stu at all ever? 
Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yes, I did. Isn't that amazing? Like 1915, he's born like you know, be, the, after the turn of the century. Like how crazy is that? Be, before prohibition, alcohol prohibition. You know, mm-hmm. my my grandfather, who's not alive, was born in 1903. And I just think that is like, that's like when everybody was coming across to the country <clears throat> at the turn of the century, immigrants. Um, and, and apparently my grandpa was already born here, which, you know, people would assume he came over, but I guess his parents came over. But anyway, that was just so long ago. It's crazy to think, you know, alcohol prohibition, when you think about it, it seems so long ago. And it was a hundred years ago. But 100 years, really, generationally, when you look at it like that, boom, it's so quick. It is so quick. Real quick, you know. <laughs> I, I met Stu at the Terry Funk Ranch, I believe. Oh, okay. The, yeah, yeah. Terry Funk Ranch. Yeah. Yeah, the, yeah, and just like everyone had warned me uh, when I met him and shook his hand, he put my thumb in a in a thumb lock. You know, everyone <laughs> told me he was going to do that. Watch out, he's going to shoot on you and, like, you know, and, uh, <laughs> so I was expecting it, but he did it anyway. I let him do it. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, cool. Yeah, he, I he was known to be kind of um, well, like his older age and stuff like that. They said he was hard of hearing and kind of thing, but very stoic all the time too. Brett made mention of him being like a stoic person and stuff like that. Um, they said a big part of it was uh his down like obviously. I'm a like, big fan of stoicism, by the way. Yeah, stoicism. <laughs> <laughs> right. So, but uh, apparently losing Owen was a big part of like just him kind of going downhill a little bit too, because he constantly kept in touch with Owen uh, and Owen would always prank him on the phone, like pretending to be people and stuff like that. So like they had a pretty good relationship. Um, I, you mentioned like, like following guys like Lanny Poffo and stuff like that starting off, but Owen kind of on your early radar too. I know he was you guys kind of aligned in the same, he was a little bit older, but like, did you have him on your radar as some of a wrestler that was like kind of like a high flyer and did some pretty unique stuff? Like for- yeah, when he was the Blue Blazer, um, I was really turned on to him. Um, I was a fan because I remember seeing him at the Kellogg Center. Mm-hmm. And um, I think like when he would enter the ring, he would jump right up to the top rope. And then he would uh, do a backflip into the ring as the Blue Blazer. And uh, for a while there, you know, that's how I would get to the top rope was the way that he did it. But I think I modified that now because he'd be on the outside. uh, And I think he would step off the second and then spring up to the top. But then you got to turn 180, you know, when you're landing the top. But anyway, I was inspired by that. He, he, uh, he would, I, I think that's probably why when someone goes to backdrop me, I like to roll and land on my feet. You know, that was something that Blue Blazer used to do. Probably not just him. I mean, I saw the Bulldogs do it, whatever. But, but um, yeah, he he was uh, definitely on, on my radar. And uh, um, when I did the invasion on raw in 97 when I was there as Mr. Monday night and I wrestled Jeff Hardy and two cold Scorpio a team with Jerry Lawler during, during that run. Owen, uh, after my first match that I did with Jeff, uh, Hardy, um, when I was back in the dressing room to, uh, Owen, uh, wanted to break, break the ice, you know, and, say something to me and he said uh i i like it when rob's here he had one match i got five new moves (laughs) 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 it's cool it's cool to think of him saying that now and thinking about how he inspired me to come up with different moves you know yeah yeah Uh i'll cross cross propagates there or pollinates (laughs) <laughs> Pretty sweet. Um, well, I I noticed this when uh, it, when Meltzer wrote up about Stu here. This is a pretty good rib, and I wanted to get your thoughts on it because I know you're not a fan of ribs, but this is a pretty good one. So I wanted to see what. You think. A fan of ribs. So well, well, ribs. 
Yeah, so oh. sir, so Stu Hart had a favorite rib apparently. Okay. So this is what it's what happens here. Stu's favorite rib was was what became known as Mabel parties. They would do this to the new guys. This is up in Calgary, obviously. They'd tell them about this woman who lived in a farmhouse just outside of town that loved to take care of the wrestlers, but she was married and her husband was out of town. They usually found a good-looking woman to play the role. They would take the wrestler to see her, and just as something was about to happen, the husband would come in, furious, with a gun, and kick the door. The gun would ha have blanks, and one of the wrestlers in on the gag would jump and try to calm him down. The guy would shoot the wrestler, who would go down, preferably ready with ketchup. Stu would tell the guy to run as fast as he could. Sometimes he'd have the guy chase the new car sprinting down the vacant highway for miles. Yeah. <laughs> While there are many victims, the most famous one was the Great Antonio. Do you remember the Great Antonio, Rob? He was like this heavy set dude. He looked like Bruce Volant from the Hollywood Squares. <laughs> but Antonio Inoki beat the shit out of him. Anyways, he freaked out seeing the guy get shot. The ketchup blood and the people laughed for decades. The idea of this 450 pound man with unkempt hair and scraggly beard running for his life to uh, down a good empty ro road. So, is that a good river or a bad river, Rob? <laughs> No, uh, yeah, it's a funny, uh, funny visual, you know, but yeah. how crazy and, and to think that it was, it was something that, that the boys would be okay with doing, you know, well, I don't mind if the husband ain't there, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, could you imagine like, oh, like, all right, I'll go up there. She's pretty attractive, you know, the scruples, it's. The scruples. Yeah, that's pretty funny. No doubt about it. All right, uh, another. Is that by the way? Is that the one where Anoki, um, where the guy wasn't selling when yes. Anoki's not picked, so he starts like open palming him and, and then just beating the fuck out of him. Basically. Okay, yeah, I'm yeah. familiar with that match. Yeah, that's the great Antonio. So, okay, so, yeah. Mm -hmm. Uh, so no, three days later, another legendary wrestler actually passed away. Uh, Road Warrior Hawk a.k.a. Mike Hegstrand, civilized pro wrestling in the 1980s. He only he was only 46 years old and came from a parent heart attack. Um, oh, 46? 46. 46 wow. Uh, late on the evening of October 18th. Oh, no, yeah, October 18th. They said they found him in his condo, but it was listed as October 19th. Um, what memories do you have of Road Warrior Hawk, Rob? <laughs> <laughs> you don't know? I do know. I do know. Okay. I know. Uh, well, there was only like two times that I was around him. Uh, the first time he was a complete uh, asshole to me. And I talk about it in depth on uh, my RVD allergy episode on uh, my YouTube page. Um, what was that on? Was that on Pride? It was on Ego. Um I remember there was the one got job guy that was a real asshole to you. To you mentioned in, in one of the videos. Uh, well, this this we were in Aruba. I mean, mm -hmm. fuck, I might as well tell the story real quick. Uh, that's if we got nothing else on this show, at least we got uh, RVD stories. That, <laughs> knows about. So anyway, this is ninety five, I do believe, in Aruba, Aruba Bonaire, Carousel, Three Islands, Eddie Mansfield booked this trip. Uh, I'm so happy to, it, you know, I'm in 24 and I'm so happy. This is like a dream booking for me to go to the ABC islands. And one of the guys, um, Austin idol didn't show up or, or, or canceled or whatever backed up, whatever. So now I'm working twice a night, but I'm getting paid more. So that's extra cool for me. Um, and we had the first night in Aruba, mm -hmm. um, and, um, I wrestled me and Marty Gennetti tag team and Marty does not remember this match. No, <laughs> he does not remember ever tagging with me, but we did this in Aruba and it was against the Mongolian stomper and, uh, somebody, and I'm, I'm not, I'm not sure who the other uh, person was. But, um, damn, it might've been Newcast Bob. Um, but these are IWF wrestlers. Okay. And then, uh, from, from Universal Studios. 
Yeah. But then I come back and I wrestle uh, Dick Slater later in the card to take uh, Austin Idol, mm-hmm. his place. Yeah. And, and uh, anyway, first night, the ring was the shit. So right off the bat, everyone's like, dude, let's go down to the floor. And we just dove out and we're fighting on the, on the, on the parking lot, you know. Uh, not a huge crowd like we were told was going to be there. But, you know, there was some people there for an indie show. Boom, it was awesome. I was snorkeling, having the best time ever. We go to the second island, uh, Bonaire, um, and uh, <laughs> they got these little-ass airplanes that fit, like, four people, and they got a shuttle back and forth to get us. Bumpiest ride ever. If you're scared of flying, this is not for you. I mean, it was... <clears throat> it was all over and anyway i didn't mind i was still happy you know i i skydived a few years before that and uh you know didn't even wasn't even didn't even didn't even i don't think it even changed my heart rate to be honest with you when i when i skydived but anyway um we went to bonaire and then um when they brought hawk over um he he was complaining so much and and I must, you know, <laughs> I'm not judging him, but yeah. all he did was complain. He had a horrible time there. He hated the airplane. Uh, you know, he hated everything about being there. Uh, he and whoever else was in power, which would have been Brutus Beefcake. Um, I think that's. I think that was the main event, maybe. Um, they they canceled the second show. They were like, no, we're not even going to go because promises are made, whatever. Um, I was still getting paid. I was snorkeling. It, the water, the, everything was so great. Coral Reef had a great time. Um, uh, on the on the third day, and uh, we didn't do the show, obviously, you know. The, the, but um, at the very last day, Everyone's in the hotel bar, you know, and there was a girl that was the local promoter that apparently Hawk had blamed her and the promoters for promising the world and then delivering, you know, a couple of rocks. Not the experience that I had, though. So, uh, you know, when, when I saw her, no, I came into the bar and I saw her, you know, I was like, hey, you know, and I'm hugging her and, and you know, hey, and, and shaking the hand of the dude next to her. Hey, dude. Yeah. Thank you for the tour. You know, and I'm drinking a beer and all of a sudden, you know, I look over and Hawk's just eyeballing me and he cut this biggest promo on me. You remind me of every fucking rat that I've ever fucked on the road. Are you fucking serious? You're never going to make it in this business. One of those nights, you know, uh, he was like, get the hell out of my bar. And I'm like, you serious? You want me to leave? He's like, I'm fucking serious. Get out of here. Right. And I, you know, and of course in my mind, I'm thinking like, can I take this guy? You know what I mean? Yeah, like, yeah. You're like, ah. In my mind, you know, I'm thinking like, you know, what should I do? You know, I got my pride, my ego. Plus, you know, at that time I was still a punk, you know, thinking like, thinking I was indestructible anyway, you know, really. But, but it wasn't, but I was, you know, it wasn't something I was going to jump at the opportunity to fight him, you know, and I'm, and I'm looking and I'm looking at the other guys and shit, you know, and, and, and I decided, you know, whatever, dude. And I started shaking the wrestler's hand really slow drinking i went over the next guy i'm shaking his hand you know and if i remember right but it was so long ago it's possible my brain added this part but i think he pushed me in my back i remember like turning around and looking at him in my mind i'm already planning what i'm gonna do if i'm gonna do something you know step behind side step behind sidekick i connect with him in his face there's no way, I don't care how big he is, that he's not going to sell the fuck out of that. I got a sweet, strong step behind sidekick with all my ass and momentum and weight going into it. Should I do it? You know, like now would be the time, you know, should I do that? And then, and then what are the consequences, you know, then what, then we're fighting and then, and then what, you know, how's that going to turn out, you know, and then, and uh, is it worth it? So, huh, you know, and I, and all this going on, you know, my pride is like, do I swallow my pride? Because that's what it would take if I can turn around and walk out right now. Right, yeah. But a 24-year-old walking away from World Warrior Hawk, I mean, how much shame is there in that? At the same time, you know, 
I think maybe, nah, you know, fuck it. So I left. Mm-hmm. And I went, I went uh, to my room. A couple of the other guys ended up coming up to my room. We smoked, drank. They were like, yeah, Hawk's just fucked up and drunk. Whatever. You know, the next day on the uh, way to the airport, we're all riding together. He acted like it never even happened. Didn't mention it. Was fine with everything. Like, you know, like maybe he didn't even remember it. I don't know. But um, I never saw him again until me and Kane were tagging in WWE and uh, we're wrestling Hawk and the Animal. And at this time, I was like, okay, you know, let's see. Let's see if he's going to be an asshole today. Because by this time, you know, despite what a lot of the listeners think, you know, at 30, I'm way tougher than 20. At 40, I could kick way more ass than 30. I've just learned so much more. And in, in anyway, my mind now is I'm not that kid. Yeah. And I'm in a fucking great position right now in WWE. I've been here for a few years. I'm over as fuck. He's here looking for a job. Yeah, that's right. Let's, let me see. Let's go talk to him, you know, and see what the fuck's up. Because, hey, I got my memories. You know, uh, that's that's all I got to judge him by. Went over, and uh, when we talked to him, uh, boom. It was just like, you know, it can never happen. Like, he he, he was humble. You know, he was like, he, he totally wasn't thinking about that night. You know what I mean? Uh, and he didn't show it. And he might not even have known it anymore. I don't know. But he was a way different person and, and easy as fuck to, uh, to get along with to the point of, of where, you know, there was absolutely nothing to um, any any kind of bad vibes. Um, you know, I, I, if I remember right, I think he fucked up a little bit, like no sold the finish and stood up or something weird at the end of the match, you know, and they never brought him back again. Yeah. Well, I have the last minute of the clip actually on here, so, of you. And it's actually, it all took place in Philadelphia too, Rob. So how about that? Oh, no, that's it. Yeah, that's yeah. I felt extra tough in Philly too, you right, know. Right. Like, all right, motherfucker from my past, from my past, you bully, <laughs> bully ass bitch. <laughs> Look at inside, step you. <laughs> there you go. It's a sidekick. <laughs> oh, that's right. That behind sidekick. <clears throat> oh, oh. Now, he's always been cool as hell, Joe. I don't Damn. know why. But... Yeah. I like that rolling thunder, by the way. <laughs> yeah, thanks. <laughs> right to give you. Yeah. I mean, so 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 right, they're going up here, Rob. Oh shit! This is a cool spot. I like it. I like what happens here. Okay. Oh shit! Uh oh, what's happening? Well, you ducked it. Oh, I ducked it. You ducked it. Oh. KR calls it the devastation device. I think it's the doomsday device. So must have changed in WWE. Choke slam, boom. Oh, to the top. You know what? That I did get that from Owen. I think, but he could, the yeah. way that he, the way that I hold the turnbuckle mm-hmm. when I jump up there, see, I got that from Owen because he would jump up, but on the outside, he would hold the turnbuckle like that. I think he would step on the bottom rope and use that. Oh. He would spring up. He would spring up to the top, holding the turnbuckle. And, and, and I did get that from watching him. I could tell seeing that right there. Well, how about but, that? That's pretty sweet. Yeah. yeah. So, no, I, when I I didn't, I was like kind of. I didn't even know that they wrestled you guys. Like, and they were just there for a one-off, basically. Well. I don't know if it was always going to be a one-off or if that was, you know, just how it ended up because of uh, their, um, I don't want to say audition, you know, try out, you know, I mean, if they were, I don't know, maybe if they would have been impressive, they would have had a job. That was what I understood anyway. Yeah. Well, according to Meltzer, it was, they were there for a tryout basically. And then uh, it was, I think it was going to just dark match or something that they were going to compete on. But here they put, put you guys <laughs> against the tag team champs and so uh, on television. So that's what happened. And to your point, too, it looks like 
I think he got up pretty quick after the match and left or something. So I don't know. Exactly. There that was something to that that was written about that was frowned upon that, you know, I, 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 yeah, I don't really remember. Um, but man, what a, what a shame, short life, you know? Yeah. And I know, I know a lot of people have way fonder stories of him than, than, than my own, you know, he was, he was as one of the boys as you can get. I know uh, Scott Norton and him are, are tight. That's not necessarily a plus from my perspective. From your perspective. <laughs> but, um, you know, um, what a career. How, how, how fucking inspiring were the Road Warriors, you know? I know. Well, speaking to that, too, um, Meltzer writes, the most notable spawned by their success as a concept by Rick Bassman in Los Angeles designed to have baby face road warriors before their official face turn. So the warriors were still here. Uh, the warriors were still here at Hills at this point called the power team USA, which were sting and the ultimate warrior. So they, they got their inspiration from having baby face road warriors. Um, and then apparently it was Bill Watts who came up with the idea of face paint for the road warriors too. Hmm. Did you have any connections with Bill Watts at all? He was a polarizing figure in wrestling. Dude, when you're, I'm as OG as it gets, you know, like you, you, it's like that six degrees to Kevin Bacon, but when it comes to wrestling, I got one degree with everybody, I feel like. Yeah, you just have a connection right immediately. <laughs> yeah, it seems like it. I mean, maybe two degrees sometimes, but there's very few people that I very haven't. Few people you don't have, you've never read. At least, at least since the 1900. <laughs> right. <laughs> well, the turn of the, turn of the last century. Um, so Bill Watts was, uh, he hired me in December of 92 when I went to WCW. Okay. So, uh, he had the book, Ron Slinker, who named me Rob Van Dam was buddies with him from the UWF days. Mm -hmm. And, um, I had a meeting at the CNN towers or whatever in Atlanta and then uh, I wrestled, and it was the underdog challenge match. I basically already had a job as long as I didn't fuck it up real bad. So it was it was like called a tryout, but I already they already planned on keeping me. And uh, Bill Watts didn't want to use the name Van Dam, and that's what really stood out about that first meeting. You know, like there's already an actor with that name. Um, why would you want to be confused with someone else? When you're when you're trying to make a name for yourself, you know, and he's trying to make a name for himself, and I was like, you know, uh, um, <laughs> this guy gave me the name over here because Slinker gave me the name, but by that but by that point, let's see, he gave me the name in uh, November of ninety one, and now we're talking one year later, December ninety two. So by this time. I'd been Rob Van Dam for about a year. I'd been in some magazines. I had a huge following of probably 300 people that knew who I was. So I felt like I didn't want to give up the momentum that I'd been building because I felt like I was going to be a, a world champion. You know, um, Bill Watts was like, think of something else, not Rob Van Dam. And I was like, oh. Damn, really? And Slanker was like, all right, all right, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll talk it over. And, and he's thinking, and then he goes, I got it, Robbie V. And I was like, yeah, yeah. I mean, the V stands for, yeah, that's cool. I mean, if we have to, then uh, that sounds as good as any idea I could think of. And boom, then I was Robbie V. And then, but I liked that I could read in the reports like Meltzer's or whatever, the dirt sheet, you know, uh, whatever it was, that they that they would still call me Van Dam, even though I was Robbie V. And yeah. then I was like, then I was like, yes, um, you know, uh, validation. You know? <laughs> <laughs> I still have that cachet. <laughs> also, I stayed there till May of 93, and then I quit WCW on my own mm -hmm. because, because working conditions – were better for me outside of WCW. And I knew that. Um, but while I was there, you know, there was a change in the office. The beginning of the year, like in February 
from Bill Lutz. He left, and then um, Ole Anderson took over. Oh, okay. Ole Anderson didn't have the same like for RVD that Bill Watts did. So that had a big reason. That was a lot of why I ended up leaving. I, I found myself lost in the shuffle there, only used for dark matches and or giving tryouts. And my I was only getting a uh, hundred bucks uh, anyway. And, 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 you know, I had to pay for the car and the hotel and, Anyway, it was just like it was a good decision for me to leave. But what I wanted to say, the other thing about Bill Watts that I associate him with that I always will, besides hiring me, having me change my name from Rob Van Dam to Robbie V, also something that was a pretty significant part of my career to talk about because it was such a timepiece. He banned the use of top rope. The top That's rope right. was banned. Yeah. So so that was weird. And then and then he said it was okay for me to do the split legged moonsault because I'm just like bouncing off of it. But he didn't want anyone climbing up there anymore because everybody was doing it to the point where they felt it didn't mean anything. And they felt like nobody knew how to wrestle anymore and just lock up and, and go at it, you know, and, and that every, and that they, they were trying to protect the business from dissipating into a high spot fest. And that was his answer of doing it was banned uh, all of us from, from climbing up and uh, jumping off the top rope. So that was, <clears throat> that was Bill Watts. Wow. How about that? Yeah. I remember him instilling those kind of old school kind of rules that like kind of like limited a lot of the aspects of what wrestling was becoming and turning into and stuff. So uh, that's wild. Yeah. And I was going to, that was what I was going to follow up with is it was he around during your time in WCW, but yeah, he, he brought you in. So how about that? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And I've, I've seen them at uh, conventions like mm -hmm. over the last few years, a couple of times, not, not very often, but I seen him once or twice after a, uh, 30 year <laughs> hiatus, <laughs> not seeing him, you know, and shook his hand and, uh, um, and, and Eric Watts, you know, was with him too. So that was cool. Cause, uh, I tagged with Eric Watts back in the day and, uh, and, uh, you know, knew him as, uh, one of the, one of the guys in the dress room. I probably rode with him in the car a few times. I don't, I don't know, but I feel like we were around each other a little bit. So it was cool to, Oh, that's your dad. Hey, what's up, Bill? And, um, you know, it was cool. He remembered me. How about that? So, and he appreciated your work overall as a wrestler back then too. Uh, basically. Well, he wouldn't have booked me just as a favor. You know what I mean? Yeah, he, exactly. he had a lot more respect for the business than that. Yeah. Yeah. But looking back at it now, you know, I was so green, you know, and I'd only been working a couple of years, like to be on TV and I've only been working like, you know, three years, uh, two, three years. That's, that's, that's how it looks to me too. You know, even just watching this shit that we were just looking at with me and Kane and the Road Warriors, watching that, I feel like the business has changed so much since then. You know, like, is that stuff even exciting? You know, like, ooh, I ducked and I turned into a sunset flip. I mean, now the way the, the style is and all the athletic performances, like, I don't even know if, like, that match would even get the reaction from today's crowd that, that it did then if it was the exact same that's how i felt watching it at least as far as my reaction went. see when i watch it too i felt like i was into it you know because it i think the pacing of it all just made more sense to me than what i'm used to seeing today from the modern perspective of it all so it was like mm -hmm. so it's interesting that you'd have that take on it too so how about yeah. That? Mm -hmm. yeah um, I'm, the I'm the last guy that wants to to watch rvd so <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> well, okay. So in this very issue of the Observer that I pulled from, this actually popped up on here, and I wanted to see uh, your get your take on it. Okay, so Melter writes, since the future of RVD seems to always be asked about, his three-year contract expires during the summer of 2004. At this point, they have not, with the exception of one preliminary discussion, started any talks about a new deal. It will be interesting because he came in with a decent size downsize guarantee. And WWE has been largely cutting down downsides for most of the talent 
and their prices have been up, except top-level guys. Van Dam himself over the weekend said he has not even started any real talks of renegotiations other than that he's been alerted by the office, even though his deal isn't up soon, that they should start talking about a renewal. Do you remember any contact track discussions at this time? Does that stuff stand out to you, like, with, that you retain or anything like that? Um, man, I'm trying to remember who I would have talked to. I don't think Johnny was there yet. I think it would have been Jr. That's what I was thinking. Maybe Jr. Originally, I signed a three-year deal, and uh, and 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 they're right. You know, contrary to a lot of reports, I had a, a decent and escalating, continuously escalating downside guarantee, and uh, so at the end of the three years. What did I sign? Uh, uh, maybe another two years, maybe. Did you last right until like what was it? Two thousand seven, right? Was that when you were done? Uh, I it was two thousand. I always forget if it was six or seven. Like, like I, to me, it's, it should be. I think it's six. Okay. I don't know why it seems like seven, but that doesn't make sense in my head because I think two thousand five was ECW. 2006 was John Cena ECW. Yep. And then uh, I had the belt. And then shortly after that, I, I left, right? Because, yeah, yeah, it wasn't too long. I got suspended, came back from the suspension. I said, hey, this sucks. They, they're killing ECW. They, they they want me to start the, you know, eating shit now because um, of me getting busted and my contract's coming up. And I, don't have it in me anymore. So it had to have been 2006. Yeah. Okay. Um, when you but, got it, yeah. But in 2005, I, um, I, my ACL snapped and I had to take 12 months off. And so um, I got paid the whole time I was off. So it ended up being my favorite year out of my whole deal because I had that downside guarantee, yeah. not the original, but a better one. Cause I had resigned after those first three years. Uh, but then I had to make up the time afterwards, uh, although I got paid for it again. So it wasn't like I had to make up what they paid me, which you would have to do um, with appearances as far as when it went against your guarantee. But um, anyway, uh, having said all that 2001, a three year deal. So then in 2004, um, it was probably a two-year deal. Maybe it was a one-year deal, and then it just got extended because of my injury. Obviously, I don't remember exactly, but um, I just remember when I left um, talking to Johnny and them really wanting me to stay, trying to talk me into staying within reason, you know, not giving me everything I want, but... Um, but, you know, trying to get me, trying to talk me into uh, not leaving after that Randy Orton concussion match that I had. And I walked off into the sunset and I never wanted to go back to full time ever again. Yeah. But I remember those, I remember those contract talks. I don't remember the 2004 ones. Okay. Okay. Um, you did get a good downside guarantee, I imagine, on the second re-signing though, huh? Well, I mean, um, I, it was worth it or I wouldn't have done it, but I mean, it's not, sure. there's nothing to, to, uh, to, to brag about in the entertainment business, anything like that, yeah, or even, yeah. in the, even in the wrestling business, it wasn't like, you know, like he was taking care of me, like I'm Brock or it wasn't like that, you know, <laughs> yeah, but. But, but, but they were interested in me. They wanted to keep me. They, they, um, you know, kept, uh, Kept it, kept it on a uh, uh, um, an escalating uh, foundation to offer, you know, an increasing incentive, that kind of thing. Yeah, yeah, that, definitely. You want to give your guys incentive like that. Um, okay, so apparently, too, this is also in this, the very same newsletter. You did an interview that said Van Dam continue. Oh, this is what Meltzer writes: Van Dam continued to not tow the party line. During an interview over the weekend on Get uh -oh. in the Ring, uh oh, on Get in the Ring radio show, 
when bringing up the Intercontinental title, he didn't act like he was that excited. <laughs> he said, for the most part, I don't care. I've had the Intercontinental belt I don't know how many times. I read somewhere I beat Benoit for it three times. I don't even know if that's true. If it is, I must have had it five times. And then you said, I think the real number is four. And the fact I don't know for sure tells you something because in the days when the belt meant something, everyone could have off the top of their heads given the correct number. Uh, this is quite the oh. push away from like your ECW TV title reign where you held it for how long. And so uh, <laughs> you like it is it makes sense. though. like that's a lot of times in like when you hold the intercontinental any belt for that many times, it seems like it kind of does lessen the value. It, it's just, it's a different way of how they handled it around the time. So many belt pot, hot potato with the belts, basically. Well, without, without saying whether I was right or wrong, that wasn't very uh, professional like of me to, to say, you know, as far as like, uh, you know, like when you, but now, I think about like um, uh, helping promote, you know, uh, like even if someone books me a wrestling company and then afterwards, if I see their posters online for other shows and I'm not on them, boom, I'll still like share them or like them or whatever. And I feel like, I feel like that's like me being professional, you know, and like, like, like they should get that for working with me and stuff. And, and likewise, I feel like, working with WWE, if you're out doing interviews and, and stuff or whatever, then you should be like a, like pro company. Uh, but for me, you know, I, I've always just wanted to keep it so real that um, I think sometimes that might have uh, taken over when looking back, I might not have made the same decision. You know what I yeah, mean? Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. You definitely like kind of think about it from a different perspective when it comes to... Uh, yeah, without saying if I'm right or wrong about... Right about about the belt you know i mean like and i and i obviously probably i think i felt like they didn't know what to do with me either i felt like they didn't know what to do to capitalize on how over i was um and and i felt like paul knew but they didn't want to listen to him and that was kind of what i remember my mindset being like um which you know really looking at it now like it takes an ego even to even, but I did, you know, I was over, <laughs> you know, yeah. I was going to say it takes a big ego to think they're just not using me right. You know, like I could make them so much money. Like that takes a big ego to, to, to think that, but I'm just saying I saw all the RVD signs and people that said, had signs that said I paid to see RVD and I connected with all of those fans and got the loudest pops and uh, because of these kinds of reasons, I often felt like they were confused because they didn't think that I should work the way work as far as my formula. You know what I mean? Yeah, they didn't yeah. think that, everything about me, they didn't think that that should work because that's not the traditional wrestling. You know, mm -hmm. they went, Dub, I'm going to rip your eyes out. You're dead. Yeah, I, it's, dude, you got so, so many people like that. And now you know, everyone's evolving. And I was part of that evolution to where we are now, obviously. I've obviously inspired a lot of wrestlers now by, by being so different. But that is how I remember my, my mindset being uh, back then. Yeah, and I was, I was actually going to ask you that later on, too, where your head was kind of at at this time. Because you're winning the Intercontinental belt. You're still in the mix as, like, one of the high-profile stars. But they're kind of looking at like John Cena's on the rise at this juncture. Then you have Randy Orton coming up and the evolution is all there. So there's all this, these different elements coming into play. And I was kind of, that's kind of what I was going to follow up with is like where your head was at overall at this juncture. So, um, yeah, man, I, I, you know, I, I remember just like trying to tread those waters there. Um, a lot of what was rough for me was just the damn politics, you know, it was yeah. like, I was just swimming in politics and it's like, you know, how do you get ahead here if it's not by winning the fans over or if it's not completely just by winning the fans over, what else is there? And, and, you know, is that something that I can do or that I want to do, you know, and, uh, and, and who else is doing it? And is that how they're getting ahead of me? And man, just like all of that going on, was was it just felt like so so competitive that it was hard to even uh 
be happy for everybody else. Every, it felt so, so much, you know, like that, that should be me, you know, cause you were yeah. promised that. And then they gave it to someone else. That's why you feel that way. But I think every wrestler pretty much has to relate to that uh, kind of feeling, uh, especially when they go through the big show like that. And, you know, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm glad that right now I've, I'm not still in that state of mind. I had to get out of it when I had to get out of it. But, um, you know, right now I'm glad that I have the uh, foresight to be able to think bigger and, and talk about it and, and understand uh, a bigger perspective now because that's, that's important. That shows growth, you know. <laughs> yeah. um, also in this interview, you said he said he's gotten a rep for not being good on interviews, but it's because all the writers script him to say for script him to do say is cool. So people think he can't talk. He complained about constantly being told to tone it down to avoid an injury, but he hasn't gotten seriously hurt. He also said he's never gotten any heat in WWE for any of his interviews. Yeah, so the, they scripted you to say like stuff like cool and dude and stuff like that. That had to be kind of frustrating, I'm sure. <laughs> I mean, I could have taken more control if I would have had ideas, if I would have been inspired to mm -hmm. look at their script and then make it my own. But I, I, that wasn't something that I've ever really been good at, faking an interest in something. I mean, now I could probably you know, fake it as an actor, you know what I mean? But um, back then, it was more like I was myself. And so, like, if I really was telling everybody that this match that I have with Christian – on Saturday means more to me than anything in my whole life. I'm going to be laughing at myself and, and feeling like I'm making myself into an asshole. But now I could, I could, I could probably do it, you know, but back then I, I really felt more attached to what I was saying. So when I read the script and it's like, cool, whatever, then, um, I, I, I would never, you know, look at that and say, you know, what would really make this good. What if I walked into the room, you know, and Booker T had this towel around and we're coming out of the shower. And then what if I did, I didn't have that kind of inspiration. I was just like, what do they want from me? I just want to wrestle. And that's, right. that is mostly how I felt, you know, looking back at the ECW promos, I did have some fun with the promos sometimes, you know, yeah. they were fun. Um, I feel like they were more what I wanted to say and stuff. And that, and that all of a sudden um, I had to talk about stuff I didn't care about and pretend that I did. And, and just the whole agenda was way different. Yeah. And I remember just going back and watching like older footage of you doing the interviews. I think it was like for the tag match with uh, you and Sabu against like Lance Storm and Candido and like, the, the dynamic between you, Sabu, and Bill was great. Like, it was just, like, fucking, like, you are kind of fucking with Sabu and, like, kind of trying to take the spotlight and all that kind of thing. Yeah, that was fun. Yeah. Was fun that kind thing. of stuff. Yeah. Um, I, I, I was asked about this, like, a, a year or two ago. Otherwise, I would have forgot because it's a really faint memory. But sometime... And this would have been before 2004. Um, I, I, they, they, I guess, I think it was Hunter <clears throat> asked or offered, I think he pulled me aside and, and, and offered to, um, he, he would help me with my promos. Mm -hmm. And I think I was insulted by that. My ego, competitiveness made me feel like he was saying I couldn't talk, you know, and I was like, I don't want to talk like him. You know, I'm RVD. He just don't get me. And I think I felt, you know, more like that. And that probably, you know, very good chance could have led to some of the long time, long term heat that, that I had while I was there, possibly looking back oh, at it. Yeah. Yeah. Huh? Well, uh, like, no, but I mean, you had your own style of promo too. That was just, it was engaging like when I saw it on ECW and stuff, but you know, it's tough to be in that ecoscape of like competitiveness, but also politics dealing with all that stuff and trying to look out for yourself too. And being true to yourself too. I'm sure that you were just combating all of that. You know? It was hard to draw the line between being true to myself and, you know, doing the job which yeah. you know, just be professional and, uh, you know, 
just be produce this fucking we need you to say this boom say it you know and 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 you know um i gave a fuck about a lot of stuff that i probably shouldn't have given a fuck about yeah yeah maybe <laughs> maybe who knows who knows I mean, so, it got, me, got me here with that cool green screen behind me that's right <laughs> taz, taz is a fa- fan of it taz is <laughs> <laughs> all right so um some other sad news at this juncture anthony durante pitbull 2 died due to an overdose of fentanyl uh, according to the coordinate coroners reported released earlier this week, he died on September 25th. Uh, Westerly Road Island police uh, reported he was only 36 years old. Oh my God. That's it. Wow. That's it. Uh, Meltzer even mentions how Oxycot had been previously linked to the deaths of two former w- WCW employees, wrestler Bobby Duncan Jr. And free Randy Anderson. Um, Memories of uh, Pitbull 2, Rob. Any Anyone stand out to you in certain ways? Yeah, this is fun, just hitting memoirs. Uh, two memories of Pitbull, um, Pitbull Anthony. Um, so one, one memory is uh, I'm in the ring with him, not just him. There's me and Sabu, the Pitbulls, quite possibly even another tag team. I don't remember all that. But this was still me learning through trial and error um, a lot of the hardcore style and actually in life that never changes. We're all still learning. But um, I had a chair and I just started like pie facing people with it. You know, I saw Sabu do it, I think. And I was like, hey, I like that. You know, and started like using that. And this is like one of the first nights. It, and uh, Pitbull Anthony is in the corner uh, with his back in the ring. We're both in the ring and he's facing me and I threw the chair like all the way, like, you know, across the ring. And when the chair came, uh, it, it fucking spun and it spun like 90 degrees and it hit him like this. Dunk. Right. Oh, man. And, and, it, and it split him open. And, um, and uh, after the match, you know, uh, I was like, oh man, you know, sorry if, you know, pointing at it, dude, look at that. Like, sorry, uh, sorry about that chair shot, man. And he was like, oh, that's cool. As uh, long as you didn't do it on purpose. He goes, you didn't do it on purpose, did you? I'm like, no. And he's like, oh, that's cool. It, that, that stuff happens. But I learned to be more careful after that. You know what I mean? Because there was a lot of times I remember where I would just like go for it and take a chance with not just myself, but with someone else that I, that's in the ring too, you know, and, and that's part of learning. I, I see it now. I saw somebody that you see, I saw somebody on, on social media do like a brain buster on a bike. I think it was AEW on the bike in the bi- bicycle, a pedal bike that was on its side with the pedals sticking up and everything. Yeah. And when I'm watching that, I, I'm like, they, that's so dangerous. Like they don't know one little thing. If it, it could fuck up and it could like, you know, totally like change somebody's life. I, I, I I remember this one show that I did my first time in LA. Um, there was, it was a $250 black tie fundraising event. Everyone was wearing suits, eating fancy dinners, and they weren't a wrestling crowd at all, at all. It was at the Biltmore Hotel. I was stuck to be in LA, but uh, that's, a, that's another story. But at the show... Um, they came up to me and Mustafa because we were wrestling and they said, you know, the, the show is, uh, um, they're not really buying uh, the the show that much. You know, we want to put you out earlier, you know, if you go out there and wake everybody up or whatever. So we went out there and looking back at it, I was so not careful because I would pick Mustafa up and I would body slam him on a table with glasses you know, upright, okay. you know, wine glasses, plates and forks and, and knives and everything. Bam. And looking back at it, like, man, if a glass would have just sliced off and like, you know, cut through an artery or something, it would have been all over. And, and, and looking back at that, I still kind of cringe when I think about that match we had, but we did wake the motherfuckers up. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> yeah. well, we did get them up. We got Mission them up. accomplished. You know? <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Everybody was okay. Um, another wrestler, geez, passed away too at this juncture. November 6, 2003, 
crash oh home. the other the other people anthony story is uh-huh. he, he's the first uh wrestler uh he gave me my first pain pill that i ever wrestled on oh really oh. yep i had uh, hyper extended my knee uh the night before in a match with uh chris jericho at the lulu temple and uh jefferson jefferson mm-hmm. township whatever yeah. um and I was like limping and I was concerned because I didn't want anyone to know I was hurt. This was a big match. You know, we've been building up for three weeks since the last one. Hostile City Showdown. Um, this is the night that the ring kept falling apart. Oh, shit, and they no. kept putting it back together. It's like one in the morning. We're getting ready to go out there. It fell apart. They got Kimono Wanalea dancing uh, to try to entertain the crowd. This, you know, this made... This made footage that they used forever and ever of this night. Um, and, and they offered everybody uh, their money back if they wanted to go home or they could wait for our match. I didn't want to go limping out there and show up, you know, like is, a, is half of what they expected. And Pitbull Anthony was just like, here, bro, no, just take this. You'll be fine. And I was like, will I be able to, like, r- wrestle on it? You know, he's like, yeah, you'll be fine, you know, and. Looking back at it, I was just so green. I'd never done that before. And, you know, that became my routine for a while. And, uh, um, you know, it still is a concern with mine as far as, like, getting at my best, feeling at my best, whatever uh, whatever it is. But um, but back then, it was like the pill days, and we were handing around somas, whatever, halcyons, fucking pain pills. And, and then a bunch of my friends died, like the guy we're talking about. But that's another story is uh pitbull anthony gave me a 7.5 vicodin uh that i wrestled on that night and i came out there to the ring and then sabu drop kicked my leg bam right off the bat and then i was limping holy shit jeez wow wow i can't believe too jeez when i was reading this i was like only 36 that's not that's insane yeah and i felt great with that with that pill too oh jeez yeah well which so is why they, people take them. Yeah, yeah, that, that makes sense then, <laughs> especially. Um, yeah, November 6, 2003, Crash Holly passed away. And Rob, he was only 32. So, oh craziness. Um, did you have interactions with him? Uh, I knew he was kind of almost it. I was thinking about this. He's like the antithesis of you. You were the hardcore champion that kind of established the belt where he was the 24-7 kind of champ. So very different realms of the hardcore title, but. Uh, what was your interaction with Crash? Right. So uh, when I first got to WWE in 2001, Crash was still there. Mm-hmm. Was he teaming with Bob Holly, maybe? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah, he would have been. Yeah. And then, um, you know, so I just remember him being around. Um, you know, I, I didn't like I didn't like his hardcore title matches because I felt like they were making fun out of – which is fine. Even in ECW, there's fun on the show, you know. But for me, I felt, you know, like I, as an artist, I would just do that so much different and make the hardcore serious. But uh, but I, but he was always, you know, a good guy and stuff. But I remember one time we're on the airplane, and um, he was in a no selling kind of mood, you know. Mm-hmm. Kurt Henning was kind of annoying him. Uh, I, I think we just got on the plane and we, and we're just boarding still and hadn't hadn't even left yet. But he's acting like he doesn't hear Kurt back mm-hmm. there, right? Yeah. And Kurt's going. Um, um, I guess he called him Crash. What was his name? Mike. I think it was Mike. Okay. Mike. Yeah. So he was Crash. 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 And he's like, you know, like kind of like rolling his eyes, pretending that he doesn't hear him. Um, and you know, when you first get on, like all the, uh, overhead bins, the doors are still open. So you can put your bags in there. Yeah. And, uh, cra- crash, crash. He goes, go, go, go up there, go up there in your bin, go up there and crash, go up there in your, go up in the overhead bin, dude, go up there. That's for you to lay down in, go up there. And he's like trying to ignore him. And then finally I could just tell that crash said, okay, maybe if I sell this joke, he'll fucking shut up, you know? So he was like, okay. And he acted, you know, like he was going to climb in there. And then he just like sat back down with a straight look on his face. You know, <laughs> and, and, you know, I, I just seeing him do that. I was like, yeah, I feel his pain. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're like, I can empathize, sympathize. <laughs> yeah. I get that. Oh, man. 
Yeah. He was he was the personality, that's for sure. He did. It's a shame he died so young, you know. I, I'm sure he could have done a lot more too. Um, but all right, uh, November sixteenth, twenty two thousand three. That's when Survivor Series. Hey, started. wait a minute. Uh huh. Today's November sixteenth, bro. Oh shit! It is. How about that? Twenty years to the day, Rob. Yep. Twenty years to the day. All I right. didn't connect. You did. Yes, sir. So how about that? All right. So, Dean Bischoff, it was Randy Orton, Chris Jericho, Christian, Scott Steiner, and Mark Henry beat Team Austin, which was Shawn Michaels, Rob Van Dam, the Dudleys, those damn Dudleys, and Booker T. Uh, The match lasted 27 minutes and 27 seconds. Wow. This got a very good rating, Rob. I think uh, Dave gave it uh, four and a half stars, apparently. He said, in hindsight, this should have been the last because so much time was devolved. And nothing could follow Austin coming out. Because this was in Dallas, too, I believe. I think this uh, match took place in Dallas. Uh, and uh, the stipulation was if uh, Team Austin lost, Austin would leave WWE. So um, he came out, got far the biggest reaction of the night. Now, Meltzer makes a note to, that says, Steiner did a banned overhead belly-to-belly on Van Dam, And it was just a fraction away from being dangerous. Uh, <laughs> Do you remember that at all? Like, did no, happen? all my bumps are dangerous. <laughs> Come on. Come on now. All right. I man. used to tell people to purposely drop me on the back of my head and make my knees hit. Like when they would give me a German suplex or a back suplex release throw. Um, but I started doing that way early, though. Like in 93, I remember doing that in Japan. And eventually I learned to regret it. Um <laughs> <laughs> but I never let anybody know. I would just eat it, you yeah. know, because like Kabashi, he would pick me up and power bomb me, bam, you know, right on the back of my neck, and my knees would just bounce off the mat. I would never let them know they hurt me. But man, sometimes more than others, my back would be sore. That's why it's like it's weird, you know, like like I, I, I my back was sore at 23, and so if I feel fine at 52 then it's like it's hard for me to compare it all and be like, oh, it sucks getting older. Because I'm like, I, I'm i used to being, you know, hurt, beat up, sore. Um, and it's not that much different. Yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, if you think of it that way, that's kind of more uh, where I'm at with the aging thing. But, but yeah, I mean, I, you know, and I still do sometimes. <laughs> I'm on the back of my neck like that. But um, Chris Jericho used to like doing that, you know, picking me up for a German suplex and <laughs> releasing me and throwing me a little bit and land on the back of my head. But the, the power bombs, it's like, even if I'm flexible enough to do it, sometimes the impact would just be bam. I'd be like, that's right. You can't hurt me. I'm fine. I'm fine. <laughs> yeah. <Okay>. Sometimes. <laughs> All right. So then he did one of the ropes, but I'm trying to figure out. So basically you guys eliminate Mark Henry. Uh, the Dudleys give him a 3D, and RVD gives him a frog splash, and everybody pinned, piled on top of him at 10 minutes and 3 seconds. But then you were the next out. Uh, Jericho eliminated you, shoved you off the well, He helped eliminate you. Shoved you off the top of the rope, and Orton gave you, Orton gave you an RKO at 12 minutes and 6 seconds. And then uh, your team ultimately lost, Rob. Steve Austin had to leave WWE. You failed him, so he had to leave. <laughs> And this match got, but like I said, this match got a really, really good rating of four and a half stars. Do you like the Survivor Series kind of matches, types of matches and stuff? That the elimination kind of thing. Is that intriguing to you as a fan? And how about it as a wrestler? Yeah, I think so. You know, as a fan, I, I used to love to uh, get together on Thanksgiving to watch the Survivor Series, especially, you know, the first several when they came out. Um, that was that was a big deal because we'd have to go to somebody's house that had cable vision, which wasn't everywhere. And, uh, that was, that was, uh, always like, you know, a a big tradition. So I understand now it's still a tradition for, uh, for other people. And, uh, I, I guess as far as wrestling in it, I think I liked it. You know, I think it's like, um, it's cool that, you know, you're on a team, with some interesting teammates, you know, it's like a bond that uh, you may not otherwise have with uh, certain individuals. And then it's, uh, you know, everyone's going to get their time to shine and, uh, and and be showcased. 
And then um, overall, you know, it doesn't seem like it's going to be nearly as much work as a singles match would be where it's all on you. Yeah. And I, as a fan too, like, I like the intrigue of people being eliminated and like, oh man, who's going to survive? Who's going to be, is there going to be a lone survivor? So there's that added intrigue to it too. I thought I I thought it was pretty cool. So the difference with some insight from someone that's been in the business for 150 years um, the difference between this and say like a Royal Rumble match, which also eliminates people, is that like I just said in a Royal in a Survivor Series match, you get eliminated one by one, but you're in there, you do your thing, and then what? You're on the apron while someone else is in there. But like in a boy a battle royal or a Royal Rumble, it's 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 like the whole time you're working and and if you're like me, you imagine people are watching you the entire time that you're in there. So it doesn't matter as people are getting eliminated one by one or whatever, you got to go find a leg and try and try and tug on it, try and get that leg up, you know, over the top rope and then give up and poke them in the eyes and walk over to somebody else and do it. So I don't enjoy uh, those kind of matches. Uh, and, and I never have, the battle Royals. Although I do remember winning one with Mark Henry. And I thought maybe you're going to get to that. It might've been around this time. I just remember oh. Mark winning at me and me like backing up and like pulling the rope down and him going over. And it was just like, Whoa, they, <laughs> they must, they must be behind me. I just want a battle Royal. Like, wow. When I thought that they hated me, what's going on. <laughs> that's pretty good. But. That's pretty sweet. Yeah. I'll have to look that one up, but I'm sure that's around this time then too. Yeah. I'll have to, I'll have to dive into that. Um, also, also in that match, mm-hmm. Battle Royal, Titan Titus. Yeah, O'Neal. Titus O'Neal. Do you remember he used to have this move, um, which they stopped maybe this night. They might have stopped it this night. But he used to have this move where he would pick somebody up like he's like, like he's holding them um, like a – I don't know, like yeah. a crossbody. But yeah, somehow he would do something where he's got your arm twisted around and like he would give you like a front slam. He would pull your arm like a yo-yo and you would like roll and spin down and then land. Bam, all fucked up. And he did that to me, that match, and it hurt so bad. Bruised one of my ribs. And I know he got heat for it before. I mean, afterwards, he got heat from Vince. And I had to go, I can't remember why. I think he asked, if I remember right, I think he asked me to go talk to Vince and, and tell him that I was okay or that or that I said he could do it or whatever because he was, Vince was hot because he hurt me and they and they had plans with me. They were, you know, I was the guy and I was doing, they were doing this leading into something and then he just fucking hurt me. I was just like, oh, my shoulder. Maybe it was my shoulder. My shoulder, yeah, it was definitely my shoulder. <laughs> I was going to say my shoulder and my wrist, but I remember now. And it was because, and then bam, land on my side, on my shoulder like this, bam. And uh, and, and and I think they, 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 they had him quit doing that after that. Holy shit. Yeah, he had some, he had, a, I know he added some a different moves in his moveset that was, like he had like one, yeah, like he held you like almost like a fall away slam and he'd like spin you or something like that. I kind of remember too. No. There's a lot of moves I see now, like if I see AEW or whatever, and it's like a lot of times, you know, I'm like, wow, that's really creative. You know, I'm that awesome. Sometimes I'm even like, I wish I would have thought of that. And then other times I'm like, there's a reason no one's done that move before. Right. You know? That's dangerous as fuck and takes like way too much to be able to throw that in in a, in a match, you know, without that without you know growing up with the guy you're doing it with but anyway um that's that that's that there's both to that you know what i mean but a lot of moves look really dangerous that people do nowadays that that just you know a few years ago people would be like fuck no i'm not taking that you know what <laughs> I, mean? I remember one time <laughs> in south atlantic this would have been the year that i moved down to florida which was um um youtube chris no, this would have been in 90. Oh, yeah. Pretty, very early then. Wait, 89, 90. No, I'm, I'm 90. Oh, I guess it was 91. Yeah, it was super early. So 
uh, 91. And then I, I moved down to Florida and then like in 92, I'm still going back up to, uh, I'm driving from Florida up to the Carolinas for South Atlantic pro wrestling, wrestling for Greg price. He's still booking me up there. They got TV, uh, and I'm driving back and forth. Um, and, uh, one night I was supposed to wrestle a guy up there, Sammy something, and uh, anyway, uh, before the match, I was telling him like what, some of the things that I wanted to do. And then a little while later, I couldn't find him. He left. <laughs> he was gone. He, he, he just grabbed his bags and left and said, fuck this. Oh. No, not Sammy. I wrestled Sammy. It was the guy before. Yeah, the guy left. And, and then uh, anyway, yeah. And, and specifically, it was going to be like a sunset flip powerbomb to the floor, you know, uh -huh. that, that was the deal breaker. Like I'm not having that. <laughs> no, um, nowadays the style is so much different, though. And that's what I was saying about that. What I think about the Road Warrior match. But. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's, it's. I mean, like if you looked at one of the matches on that what happened on Raw or Dynamite, like and you looked at the one we just watched, it's very different. <laughs> but I don't know. I have an affection for those ones still. Um. If it doesn't mean better or worse, right? I mean necessarily on its own. Wrestling is subjective too. It's subjective. Um, Booker T, I, you tagged with him here. Is this around the time you guys really started forming a friendship around this time? Or I, pretty close from a, earlier on or something. Uh, and, and we're in 2004, right? 2003 ish. Yeah. Well, so going into 2004. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Probably so, probably so, because I used to ride with Mike Awesome um, and Sean Stasiak, and then Mike Awesome was gone for a while for whatever reason, and then uh, Sean and I ended up together, and then, I don't know if Sean got let go or whatever, but then I, I was riding then with Booker T and uh, Nick Patrick, referee. Oh, Nick's great. <laughs> yeah. We all like to smoke, so that yeah. was that was one thing. I heard the story of Nick uh, Road Dog was telling a story of how the one time there was an in oncoming car uh, their way, and Nick was driving, and they were Nick was rolling a joint at the same time, and as his car was coming, and he casually just pulled up, moved out of the way, and still rolled the joint with one hand and got it all completely. And Road Dog's mind was like blown how he's able to do keep calm, like <laughs> avoid the car potential. Car accident and still rolled the joint. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I I think about like, um, and this is man, this seems so early, but I would have been what thirty two in two thousand three. You know, I was a baby, but man, I was so stupid when I think about just uh, my sense of my own awareness and position in life. Yeah. Just you don't have it yet, or I didn't have it yet. But anyway, I remember when Nick's driving, and I had a bag of weed that um, was a little bit moist, and so I got the bag sitting up on the dash in the sun while he's driving. Uh -huh. Books in the back, and Nick's like, "Uh, Rob, is there like m m maybe this is illegal at the time? You know, you got to remember that this is back oh, yeah, yeah. back when it was illegal." Um, and Nick is like, Rob, um, is there somewhere else maybe that uh, you, you, you want to put that, you know, besides right on the dash? And I remember, and I wasn't even joking, you know, like I didn't get it. I was like, no, dude, that's the perfect spot right there. The way the sun is baking it right now, probably give it like, you know, probably like 15, 20 minutes. That thing will be, you know, we'll be breaking off buds. And he was like, um, you, you can't put it somewhere else. I'm like, dude, trust me, that's the best spot. I totally didn't even get it. Looking yeah. back at it, you know, he was probably thinking that I was just being rude and refusing, you know, being like, fuck no, you're driving. We're putting pot up in the window and you're getting busted, you know, but I didn't mean it like I didn't mean it like that. I was just stupid. <laughs> <laughs> oh, shit. Well, okay, so following real quick after that, uh, after Survivor Series, you had a match with Ric Flair the next night on Raw. It was uh, Intercontinental Title Defense. Uh, you were banned 
banned from using the five star frog splash in the match. You could not use it. Uh, Randy Orton was on commentary. I mean, Rick, Rick got that banned because uh, he always says I'm like about the stiffest guy he's ever been in the ring with. And I don't he never fails to tell me that every time I see him. I don't want to take that. Um, <laughs> but I got to watch this match. I actually have the clip if you want to check it out real quick. It's only three minutes, but uh, okay. we did a. Uh, it's a it's a good one, Rob. Uh, I it's, it's pretty neat to see you and Flair tie it up. You know where it is? This oh, that's a good question. I am not sure where it is. I can maybe look it up. Flair, four, Van Dam. It's over. John commentary. At this point. You cannot use the five star spot. But he's got in the figure four, which he never seems to win with the figure four. <laughs> uh oh. How old is Rick there? Yeah, he looks pretty good. Yeah, he looks. So this is 2003. He's 74 right now. 20 years ago. 20 years ago, so 54. Sorry, about 54. Yeah. So that's like one year more than me. I'm about to be 53. How about yeah. that? Wow. Boom. You're doing a good job selling the leg and stuff. He's working the leg. The uh, good, good part of this. Wow! Look how young Randy is. You know, isn't it crazy? And Jerry. And Jerry. And Jay Parker. And, and Jim, too. Yeah, really. Wow. Good point, Lala. Well, 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 thanks, Rob, Chad. Thanks, Chad. <laughs> Every time I see Chad, the referee, I say, thanks, Chad. Oh, that's, is that Chad Patton? Okay. Yeah. I thought it was Jack Jonas. That's our joke forever. Like, whenever I see him, like, I saw him. I saw him. Uh, I saw him recently, whatever WWE, the last WWE event I was at, and hadn't seen him like in years. And just like, I just go, thanks, Chad. Just like we just, you know, like I would say after a match, like, you know, yeah. that's a, you know thanks, Chad. <laughs> now, would you bust some of the rest balls sometimes too? Like, I know you would. Would, give I, would I what? Bust some of the rest balls sometimes in the ring? I know you would, like, yeah. mess with Justin Roberts and stuff. Too. Yeah, yeah, I would, uh, especially Kyoto. I had a lot of fun with Kyoto. He's a character, man. I love to Yeah. I mean, I got to, I mean, they're all, well, I like that well with Thunder. Yeah. Um, hey, get back to your announcing table, young Randy Orton. You were not. How'd you get up to the, boom. Go from the announcing table up to Gorilla? What the fuck? Yeah, right? He went the long way. He did. Oh, cheap shot. The dirtiest player in the game right there. Rick just low blowed him, guys, if you're listening to the podcast. Red RVD knows how to fucking sell some fucking action. Look at that. When you get hit in the boys, you know how that feels. Good fucking strong kick out. You know what I hate now is when people don't kick out. And I want yeah. and every time I watch wrestling, I see it. They think they think just by kicking their feet. If they kick out, but their shoulders are still down and the person's still on top of them. I hate that. Oh, it's one of those like things that. that annoys me when I watch wrestling. I want to I want to tell them. But, but I always tell whoever's next to me. They were still pinned. Their shoulders were still down. <laughs> you know, because they just move that. They just kick yeah, their feet. The Kicking your feet don't do nothing. They want to think that, okay, that breaks the count. Every, no, your shoulders got to be and, up. And then every once in a while... Like, like when I was in WWE, they'd say, well, the referees need credibility. From now on, you count them down if they don't kick out. And they haven't done that in a while, and they need to. Because yeah. credibility, they haven't done a credibility check in years. Years. And it used to be cycled all the time when I was there. Yeah. But I guess it doesn't matter anymore. I don't know. I find right? it Randy, he, he, did, he dabbled. He gave yeah. Me oh. yeah. Hit Man, you in your what balls. The heck? What the heck, Randy? Okay, Good. So when you wrestled Flair like that, was it kind of a you're more that it's okay, this is my the job of mine, or did you kind of take a moment to like holy shit, I'm kind of wrestling Ric Flair? Was there a balance of that, or did you kind of more be like, ah, this is just part of the job at this juncture? At that point, for me, I'm just trying to get the job done. Mm-hmm. And this is going to sound disrespectful, but at the time he was not one of my choice opponents. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Just because it just didn't line up with your style kind of thing. Yeah. That. Yeah. You know, I mean, and, and 
yeah. But 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 I'm glad you looking back at it. I'm glad we got footage of RVD wrestling with uh, Flair, and that looked. And I liked what I just saw. You know, fucking uh, both them dudes look good. So, so yeah, I'm, I, you know, and I and I like them uh, now too. But even uh, uh, when I was there, even you you know, like like I don't know. Everyone treated him like. I don't know. I really can't like to go back into that state of mind. I feel like I'd be like rehashing talking shit, but you know, because I keep it real and and I'm on my podcast, you know, um, I don't mean any shit talking by this, but back then at that time when I was in the competitive uh, mindset and had the ego that I had, um, I felt that a lot of the boys kissed his ass, laughed, because he would uh, wear his robe at the bar, maybe with not much underneath. And, and I just thought I would roll my eyes at that. It wasn't entertaining to me. He wasn't my hero growing up. Hulk Hogan was because we only got WWF. Yeah, when people in the South, people in the South, Ric Flair was their Hulk Hogan. That's how that's how I always thought it. Um, and, and, you know, just even, even the backstage, you know, like I had, uh, I, I, you know, <laughs> I kind of there was a, there was a there was a there's a story that I won't get into, but let's just say I thought he was a stooge at one point, and uh, that he stooged on me for smoking. Mister Ric Flair that now has his own marijuana brand. Ooh, woo, woo, um, and so my feelings were among that and then having the mismatch of style where I'm in there with someone that's going to want to just chop me and me fall um, as opposed to, you know, what wrestling was for me. But again, bigger picture, we're all, we're all fucking fucked up characters and, uh, and, uh, you know, it looked like a good match, and I'm sure it probably was, but that's that's what it was like for me. It wasn't like, whoa, I'm in here with the nature boy, you know, one of the original OG champions. This guy's been, you know, like I, I didn't I never really got into that mindset. I don't think uh maybe I did with Hulk Hogan a little bit. I don't know. But but overall, overall, like when YouTube Chris, whenever he asked me stuff about this kind of recognition i always fail like he'll say like one time he said do you realize like you were a fan at wrestlemania 3 in the crowd watching it as a kid and then at wrestlemania 18 you had one of the best matches on the card you became the intercontinental champion and did you ever think when you were a kid watching it and i'm like you know i never made that connection before he he gets me with that stuff all the time yeah. And I think it's just the mindset that you get into changes your whole perspective. Of course, how can it not? And uh, and because of that, um, I, I miss out on a lot of things that should should thrill me. I think. <laughs> no, and it's like when you have that competitive mindset too. That adds another element of it. Like, hey, you're looking to be the best at it, and these are like some of the people that you're working with, but also like competing against you know to try to to try to get a good spot and everything like that so th there's that added element to it too i think that's pretty interesting um and i felt like you got a stooge at your level to to get ahead like like what what did you need to i can be stooging off on me for like what are you gonna like come on dude you're rick flair you know come on come on that's how i felt yeah it's pretty wild like uh from uh fan perspective too looking at it is like damn okay so in 2003 rvd beat rick flair and he beat the road warriors so it's like it's kind of wild i beat <laughs> rick flair and who and the road warriors oh <laughs> that is crazy huh yeah, pretty wild to kind of think about so um cool well that's uh i think that's basically all i got rob um yeah 2003 overall it seemed like an intro it's a very Wild time, I think, for wrestling because you're they're losing stars like Steve Austin, The Rock. You're still there as a mainstay. Kurt Angle's still there. John Cena on the rise. Um, Triple H is doing his thing too. So it's like, it's a very transitional period, but it's also like a, 
a period that's still kind of there. It's like it's a blend of both in a lot of ways, it seems. So uh, pretty neat that you're involved with all that. So yeah. good stuff. Cool. Good stuff. Cool. All right. Hey, it is time to wrap it up, Rob. Do you want to have an RVDology for us this week? Yeah. 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 All right. Um, do we want to touch on last week or no? Sure. Yeah, do it. Do it for you. There was a lot of aspects too that uh, came into play. Uh, a lot of things uh, with uh, some of my buddies this uh, past weekend, and uh, talking about my job situation and certain things like, you know, with writing and being freelance and all that stuff. They were kind of like giving me a little bit of shit for it uh, because I was just doing freelance. And I'm like, well, listen, I was like, I'm doing what I like. I like what I do. Uh, I'm making a living off of it, and I'm not necessarily worrying about other aspects that other people would worry about like you know having like uh, like not paying out of pocket for health insurance or stuff like that it's just like you give and you take with certain things and i like what i'm doing with my job so i'm doing this stuff for me so it certainly came to that that aspect of things and then just putting the ball in my own court of like hey taking advantage and and trying to keep the hustle of doing what i'm doing too i think um and making that a factor is like hey investing in myself to kind of make things better so that's where I definitely took pulled from this week, Rob. Nice, dude. Yeah, you know, I'm glad I'm glad we did touch upon it because on a personal note, uh, this is one of the many times when I need to eat some of my own medicine and I'm doing some reprioritizing and that fucking is definitely something to to uh, uh, to to inspire me is to do it for for myself and yeah good dude good here's what I want to talk about uh, tonight all right uh, and and I I think that this will probably largely go unnoticed hopefully you'll prove me wrong. But I just want to tell the listeners, my recommendation is care about what you say. Your word comes from you, just you. Once you say something, you're the source. Now, we've talked before about how in today's day and age, people have no accountability because of social media. They can post... um, whatever RVD is a transvestite. And then if someone says, what, where'd you get that from? They don't ever have to respond. There's just no accountability. There's, there's just, there's just nothing. People grow up and, and are used to this, this world of no accountability. And, and I've talked before about how, for me, I have to care about what I say, because when I say something, it can be held against me. So I have to be able to stand behind everything that I say because people know who I am. Doesn't mean that I'm always right. But again, that is part of caring about what you say. Being able to admit when you're wrong because you want people to know that that that, that wasn't right. That's not... That's not the facts. This is the facts. It came from you. You're the source. I've talked about this book called The Four Agreements. One of the agreements is to be impeccable with your word. Um, This is one of the reprogramming exercises that you do as an adult. You make this agreement with yourself that you're going to hold your own word in high regard because everyone is going to associate what you said with you and you have to keep that in mind. And that's your credibility. That's your integrity. That's your image. And besides you have a, a responsibility to put word out there. That's not dangerous. That's not bullshit that's truthful and maybe not everybody feels the obligation but um let me let me try and put it to you like this uh katie and i and dylan my agent 
were all in the car a couple of days ago. And Dylan, he's he's got half a brain, you know, and, and I take him as that. He, he, he said something ridiculous. I don't know what triggered it. Um, uh, he's like, uh, well, he says, I know what you said. Uh, well, you you want to do every time you hear Taylor Swift. And it was a weird comment, you know, and I, what, what did I say? I want to do every time you, you said you want to fuck her. <laughs> and, I, and I just like no sold it, you know, because there was nothing to think about it. And Kennedy's like, you said that, and I, I just said, oh, yeah, you know, that really sounds like something I would say. <laughs> and, and she knew, and she knows me, and that doesn't sound like something I would say. It sounds like m- maybe it could have been based on something, a comment, a joke, something very passive that was made. And, and then he said, well, I'm, re- I'm using my own words, rephrasing it. You said something like that. I'm like, yeah, okay, right. <laughs> a few minutes later... We're talking about Kevin, and uh, and I don't want to. I I don't know what exactly. I'm paraphrasing because I can't remember. But Dylan is telling me and Katie about something Kevin said about so and so. And the in the conversation, Dylan is saying, "Yeah, according to Kevin, I guess I guess so and so, you know, wasn't even that friendly. It was kind of a dick, you know. And so and so is just kind of mean to him, and uh, this and that." Again, I know, sell it. I let it go by. A little while later, when me and Katie are by ourselves, Katie like shocked me with with her gullibility. She says, wow, that, that sucks that, that, that so-and-so is, is uh, just mean to, to, to so-and-so all the time. And I looked at it and I said, do you know that? She said, yeah. I said, you know that's a fact? She said, yeah. I said, how? She said, Dylan told me. Or Dylan said it. I go, and that makes it true? The same guy that said when I hear, every time I hear Taylor Swift, I say I want to fuck her? Like, you hear him, consider the source. Now you're saying this fact. Now it's coming from you. You're the source. You're saying so-and-so is mean to so-and-so. I heard him say that, and I don't know that it's true. In fact, I wouldn't even give it like a 40% possibility or probability of being true. I sound annoying to myself <laughs> when I'm speaking like this I, and I'm sure it annoys her. Otherwise she wouldn't be like that. Cause she hears me say that all the time because these are my values, but I don't understand how somebody can do that. You're this, you're the new source now. Like when you go on and say, um, yeah, so-and-so was really mean to so-and-so. Like, their relationship is whatever. You do not know that that's true. Why would you say that? For me, I'm more protective of my word. I care about my word a lot. It doesn't mean I'm always right. In fact, I care so much that if I'm wrong, then I want to say it. And I'm not happy about it. I hate, I already said, I'm one of the last people that wants to hear or see Rob Van Dam or or listen to my own self-talk. But let's say we go back several years. Let's listen to RVD in uh, 2008. Let's hear RVD talk about marriage, right? Here I am talking like I know what I'm doing. Like I got life figured out. And then, boom. Boom. I'm talking about, oh, yeah, well, we're great because we're each other's priorities. You know, we don't put anything between each other. Boom, boom, boom. And then, oh, we're gone. We're split up. Now, go back and watch that. Of course, I have to cringe. What an asshole. Look at me eating crow, I think that's the expression, Eating eating my foot, so to speak. But because I care about what I say, and I care about what people hear from me. Um, I, I, I like to bring this up 
and point out, you know, that um, I still don't think I was wrong. I think the values that I spoke of back then are the right values to go for. Um, we didn't both have those and we didn't uh, uh, share those efforts. And really, we were a mismatch. For me, a lot of times when I do even these RV theologies and I'm trying to, I'm really just trying to help. These are, like I said, my values. I use these to get, get where I'm at right now. It's possible maybe in a few years I'll be saying, wow, what a dumbass I was. I didn't know what the fuck I was talking about. Maybe, I don't know. I'm 52 and I, I like my life. You know, and if I can share a different perspective, which I know I have, I know I have a different perspective. I know I think different than than most people. And so I think that's what I have to offer. But what I want to tell you is even listening to myself, a lot of times I think that I come across pompous. You know, I look at me, I listen to me, and I and sometimes I think I'm pompous, like someone that feels like they, they know it all or... Uh, you know, like, 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 like overly confident in what I'm saying. That's annoying. I don't like to hear me come across like that. That's because I care about uh, my, my word. You know, I care. It's my reputation. I have to care because I'm somebody, but also because I've had so many people tell me that something I've said has affected them in a positive way. Like, when I said recently, if you believe in you, I believe in you. I had several people come up and repeat those words and tell me that they really felt that. Uh, two, three, four people tell me that. And it's like, you know what? For me, I got to say that again. I got to make that my catchphrase for a while. I got to keep up with that because I know it works. It motivates people. And you know what? It's true. And I'm happy to inspire people and motivate people if I can, because why the hell not? You know, <laughs> who wants to bring uh, people down? Trolls. We'll talk about that on another episode. But um, being impeccable with your word doesn't mean that, that, that you're perfect. It, but, but it does mean that you're accountable for your word. You know, if I said it, bring it up to me. And, and, and if I still feel the same, I'll back it up. I'll admit that I said it. If I feel differently now, I'll tell you why uh, I feel differently. You know, sometimes um, sometimes people will just bring up something so random. I don't even know if I really even said it. They'll say, dude, I don't know if you remember this, but I, I met you back in 2002 and you, you stayed after a show. You were talking to me out in the parking lot and you told me that, uh, you know, I should, uh, I, I should go for it, believe in my dreams, or I should... Uh, I should, I should contact this person or whatever to, to start to get into wrestling, whatever it is. When I hear stuff like that, it makes me realize how important my word is. You know, what if instead I told everybody, kill yourself? Or, you know, what if I told everybody smoking cigarettes is cool? Smoking cigarettes is healthy. That's what they used to teach you because the government doesn't care about the, uh, integrity of their word they're trying to sell you something but that used to be the deal cigarettes were healthy four out of five doctors recommended marlboro my generation of people is still grew up on that and is still learning and, and trying and, and and accepting uh the health benefits of cannabis because of that because cigarettes told everyone forever that cannabis was was toxic and dangerous and poison and and it's drugs but nicotine is a way worse drug. Anyway, I just want to tell people, care about what you say because it ties back to you. That's a great reason. And plus, don't put bullshit out there. Don't put lies out there because all you're doing is polluting my universe. And uh, I happen to pride myself on honesty and integrity. And I would advise you to do the same. How about that? Yeah, Rob, I know too. It's like with, when you factor in stuff, like when somebody says something, sometimes I'll subconsciously take it as fact and not even consider 
that like okay this guy's like not fucking <laughs> like look at the context of who he is or what he's saying and stuff like that right. sometimes you just take right. it and be like oh yeah okay that that's what they said so that's what happened you don't even and think sometimes about it. and sometimes it might be a credible source you know like maybe you read it in an article in time magazine and then you're saying hey um you know what i learned today you know i learned that um uh, San Francisco is the most expensive city in the country. Okay, you don't really know that that's a fact, but you made the decision uh, to believe in the, the the credible source, and and that happens a lot of times. You know, a lot of times I'll say, you know, according to what I read today, boom, 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 because I don't know how I feel about it. I'm on the fence about it. Katie will be like, "Is that true?" And I'll be like, "According to what the guy said on the interview, or, or wherever I got it." Because yeah, yeah. Because that's my perspective and my view. But sometimes that does happen. And sometimes there's no way you should believe that person. Like, are you kidding me? Like Dylan. <laughs> like Dylan. Don't be like Dylan. <laughs> Nothing that he says could should ever be taken as even a probability, let alone a fact. <laughs> Don't be a Dylan. That's what yeah, I mean. <laughs> so care about what you say. Uh, it, it, it is tied to you. You said it. You're the source now to whoever you said it to. So keep that in mind. Yeah. When I'm writing too for the website and stuff like that, I always do according because that's what it is. It's like, you don't know if it's fact. It's, it's a report, you know, but doesn't necessarily mean that's what exactly what's going on. So it's sometimes, like, yeah, sometimes you got to reference them, right? Right. Yeah, exactly. According to the Wrestling Observer, this was said, blah, 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 blah. Doesn't necessarily mean it's true or accurate, whatever, but, you know, got to make sense of all that. So, cool. Um, guys, if you like what you're hearing, uh, go to rvdpod.com. You can get all exclusive clips of Rob and I talking about all different types of topics and stuff like that. And these RVDologies that you hear at the end of the show, too, get posted up on there. Uh, go to Rumble. Uh, I will share that link, too, in the clips below and all that stuff. Um, and maybe next of- week, we'll, maybe next week we'll... Uh, We'll go live on uh, my YouTube for a few minutes uh, to warm up before we record the show. And if so, then we need some fan interaction. We need a little bit of fan interaction. So keep your eyes peeled. Uh, We'll post on Rob's socials. We'll post on RVD pod at RVD pod. Um, But yeah, follow Rob at the real RVD. Follow me at Dominic D'Angelo. Give us all types of feedback. If you like what you're hearing, rate us on Spotify, rate us on Apple iTunes, whatever it's called, Apple Podcasts, uh, and give us some good reviews and give us some feedback. We'll like, we'd like to hear what you guys have to say. So, we'll do that live thing on Thursday. Th- that's Thanksgiving, so maybe... Oh, fuck. All right, yeah. well, you know what? Fuck it. Shitty idea. <laughs> fuck it. We'll do it live. Fuck it. We'll do it live. <laughs> Uh, all right, go. Cool. Whatever. Watch like you, said, like you said, watch for it. Watch, keep your peepers peeled, guys. We'll see you next year time here on. Be impeccable with your word. That's right. Watch.